Okay. <laughs> Our mission, Helping Parents Heal is a nonprofit organization dedicated to assisting bereaved parents. Through support and resources offered, we aspire to help individuals become shining light parents, meaning a shift from a state of emotional heaviness to one of hopefulness and greater peace of mind. Helping Parents Heal goes a step beyond other groups by allowing the open discussion of spiritual experiences and afterlife evidence in a non-dogmatic way. Affiliate groups welcome everyone regardless of religious or non-religious background and encourage open dialogue. Attendance at all of our meetings is voluntary. All discussions that take place at affiliate-led meetings are confidential. We hope that participants will learn from and share with each other. Zoom meetings run by leadership are not confidential. These meetings typically feature guest presenters and are posted on YouTube so that affiliate members worldwide can watch and benefit. Neither type of Helping Parents Heal meeting is designed to replace traditional therapy or spiritual counseling. Helping Parents Heal offers a wide variety of speakers, allowing parents to learn about many possible ways to heal. This includes presenters covering progressive topics such as afterlife evidence and connecting with our children who have passed. The views expressed by our guest speakers may or may not reflect the opinions of Helping Parents Heal leaders and members, so we ask that you take from their presentations whatever may benefit you personally. Welcome, everyone. We're so glad you could be with us this evening, and thank you, James. Yes, we are thrilled that James is here. I am just so excited. And as you all know, he's a good friend of Gordon Smith's and Jackie. Um, and so uh, we're, we're also thrilled that he's going to be joining us for our next Helping Parents Heal conference in 2024. Mm -hmm. But um, let me just read a, a little bit shortened bio of James Van Prague. I'm sure that everyone knows everything about him already, but um, I'd like to just let you know a little bit more than what you perhaps know. James Van Prague is hailed throughout the world as a pioneer of the mediumship movement and considered one of the most widely recognized and accurate spiritual mediums working today. A survival evidence medium, he provides evidential proof of life after death through highly detailed messages from the spirit realm. He is recognized annually on the Watkins list of the 100 most spiritually influential living people, a prestigious list of spiritual teachers, activists, authors, and thinkers. For over three decades, James Van Prague's messages have brought comfort and peace to millions. He has worked with international heads of state, religious world leaders, and celebrities. James Van Prague is a number one New York Times bestselling author of over a dozen international bestsellers, including Talking to Heaven, Reaching to Heaven, Healing Grief, Heaven and Earth, Looking Beyond, Meditations, um, Ghosts Among Us, Unfinished Business, Growing Up in Heaven, Adventures of the Soul, How to Heal a Grieving Heart, and The Power of Love. Currently, fans of James can tune in to his popular video podcast, Both Sides Now and Beyond, every Monday evening on the James Van Prague YouTube channel and other social media platforms. James continues to share messages from the spirit world and assist people during their lives, uh, life journeys on stage and online through his Evenings of Spirit which can be accessed through his website, www.vanprog.com. Uh, For more of James's special blend of warmth, wisdom, and spirituality, follow him on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. And I will post his website in the chat box. But without further ado, please join me and Irene in welcoming James Van Prague. Welcome, James. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Irene. Thank you. And you make me cry right away. Um, and thank you, everybody, for having me here. And um, number one, um, I'm old. <laughs> I've been around a long time with this work. And um, one of the things, your mission statement, it really just warmed my heart because when I first started doing this work, and I work with um, many different groups of uh, compassionate friends and other like, organizations as well, they were very, very careful not to have mediums there, but they didn't want to do that. And it wasn't in the thing. 
thing. And, and you've helped to change that. So I, as someone who really tried, I want to thank you for making that available to people who need it. And I mean, uh, and to everybody here, um, I honor every one of you because I think um, one of the hardest lessons in the Earth Soul School is losing a child. I, I haven't lost a child. I've lost a four-legged child. But um, losing a child, is, it, to me, is one of the hardest lessons. So I want to first congratulate you in some ways and say God, good on you. And uh, it's a hard lesson, but I think the hardest lessons are always reserved for the more advanced souls or soul groups. But um, I, I come here tonight as a, as a good friend of Gordon, who I've, I only met him probably five, six years ago. And, and we literally met in the street, believe it or not. But we had, we had so much in common, a lot of stuff in common, which I'm not going to go into tonight, but we worked really well together. And um, um, yeah, we like sharing time. You told me you had a great time you had with everyone here. So I'm going to be at the next conference. And um, I, I, I don't know where I've been, why I haven't been, but um, I, I really honor the work that's been done. And uh, thank you for having me. <laughs> so um, we would love to, I mean, one of the things that we were going to discuss is this incredible book, which is Growing Up in Heaven. And um, James wrote this book and it's so easy to read it's so simple and it actually has so many so many of the things that he talks about are exactly what we talk about but these this information that james has gotten has come from all of the readings that he's done through so many years and maybe if you could tell us a little bit more about what our kids are doing on the other side that would sure. well i i i had a couple of um uh, uh, areas here in the book that I'll through today that I thought would be very interesting um, for people that have not read the book yet. And, and how this book came about was I was in my office and I was living in Laguna Beach and I had um, a little office there and I walked in my office about one o'clock in the afternoon to sit down and do something. And all these spirit children were around my desk in the room and I'm like, okay, what are you doing here? What is this about? And they said, we're going to help you with your next book. I'm like, huh? And they said, we're going to help you with your next book. I'm like, what? And then it came in a few days later that through guides of mine, they, they're going to help you because they have passed or some passed a while ago, but they're going to help you to share their stories about their passing and about the spirit world. And I said, okay. So they're like my ghost writers. And, um, and a lot of their experiences are in the book and some of them are just really really kind of very, very interesting. Um, so it, can I just read a little bit of one, this one little chapter? Uh, of course. It? It is called Ky Kylie's Tour of Heaven. This is a, a girl that passes over. And 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 again, I'm just gonna share my experiences. And I'm free, of course, you might've heard both through Gordon or the mediums, but I, I think it's important in this kind of a situation, never to lose sight that we are all souls. We are souls having human experience, not the other way around. And we look at our lives, we're gonna realize that we're souls. We're not humans, we're souls having this human experience. And in the human experience, you gotta go through ups and downs and ins and outs and all arounds. And that's part of our soul's growth. And, and it's hard because we don't fully know everything because we're kind of in this box in this three dimensional world. But for me, it's been really helpful to understand more by communication with the other side. And when children come through, um, and it, uh, I find that the easiest communicators, them and animals, by the way, because they'll always tell the truth. Um, I'm going to start off with, um, and I'm going to cry throughout this program, so forgive me. But one of the, I'm asked many times, what's your favorite message you ever got? And I can't remember. I've been 40 years of this. I can't not remember. But there's one in particular that I do remember, and I'll never forget it because it was so incredible. I was in Maui, Hawaii at the Performing Arts Center, about 200 people in the audience, and I was doing uh, messages, demonstration. And I remember it was um, this little blonde girl, a spirit girl with pigtails. And she's about four, year, four, four, four or five years old. And she's jumping up and down on stage. And she said, and I'm just communicating with the telepathy. I said, what, what do you want to do? She goes, I want to talk to my mommy and daddy. Today's my birthday. I'm going to talk to my mommy and daddy. And I said, well, where are they? And she points. She goes back there. And I said, I have a little girl here. She has blonde hair, pigtails. She has a pink dress. Today's her birthday. Her mommy and daddy are here. And who does that apply to? And this couple stands up the back. They raise their hands. And it was a guy, big gym guy and his wife. And I said, um, she wants to say thank you for her birthday. And yes. And then um, she said some things which were pretty great. But then she said, Daddy, I want to thank you for, I'm going to cry. I want to thank you for the angel wings. And I said, do you understand what that means? And he goes, yes. He turns around, everyone turns around. He takes his T-shirt off, the muscle guy, takes his T-shirt off, turns around, and on his back, he has two big angel wings he had tattooed for his daughter's birthday. So it was like, wow. And I mean, I mean, talk about truth. It was beautiful. So 
that was that was incredible for everybody. But this is a girl named Kylie who went to the spirit world and came back and spoke about her tour of heaven. So I thought I'd share that with you. Um, as I was writing this chapter, Kylie, the little girl, oh, at the mortuary, suddenly appeared in my mind. As a medium, this trance-like state happens to me from time to time. Nonetheless, I saw. I was a bit surprised to see Kylie again. She immediately jumped up, jumped up her white, uh, oh, her white Shetland pony, she had a pony, and began flying around. Uh, just then, another figure approached Kylie. He was dressed in a tan linen, linen suit. And I quickly realized he was her guide. Who are you? I asked. I'm Herbert, he replied. I'm sort of like the welcome wagon here. And he, he goes on to, oh, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but he goes on to the different gardens that are there. He goes on to like these different buildings and was like a Roman looking building. Kali asking all these questions. She goes, why, this was really interesting. She goes, what, what, the, what has these colors? She goes, um, Kali asks, why do people have so many different colors around them? Herbert explained that colors define who they are as souls. Certain colors present a soul's level of understanding and maturity. Other colors show a soul's level of interest. For example, a soul who is a carpenter may show red, revealing a strength. As Kylie and Herbert toured the, that what appeared to be an incredible luminous landscape, I heard Kylie remark, it's like Disneyland, all the beautiful lights. Tinkerbell must be touching everything with her magic wand. And then she asked her guide, what do people do here? And Herbert then beamed and said with delight, whatever it is in their hearts that they desire. He pointed to a person playing the piano. That man always wanted to do that on earth, but he said he's finally taking the proper lessons. Then he showed a person painting on a large canvas and told Kali that there are great masters in the spirit world who teach art and music. These souls have been creative throughout many lifetimes. As they walked up a small green slope, a group of children and adults seemed to be having a picnic. It reminded me of a festival, uh, an Easter, Easter sun, Sunday outing. No one seemed to be in a hurry. I could see a huge stone building in what appeared to be a Roman plaza, complete with a towering, ornate marble fountain. Where are we? Kylie asked. Herbert answered, telling her that this was one of the many halls of reception where family and friends gather to, to greet the new arrivals. Kelly ran to play with the children in what looked like a beautiful park. That was a little part of the book from when Kylie's arrival in the spirit world with her guide, Herbert. And then I wanted to share with you also, there's a, a wonderful book um, by Life in the World Unseen by Anthony Borgia. I'm not sure if you guys know that, but you should. Um, it's Life in the World Unseen by Anthony Borgia. And it was written probably in the 40s. And it was done by, a, I think it was a minister. But when he passed over, he felt very guilty because what he experienced in his spirit levels was very different than what he preached. And he wanted to come back and, and give truth through. So I, I got this in from the book, um, Really wonderful life in the world unseen, and there's another book, life more in life world unseen. One of the best books about the afterlife that I've ever read, and I've, I've read many. But he had children in the afterlife. The, the children's realm is a township in itself, containing everything that that great minds, inspired by the greatest mind, could possibly provide for the welfare, comfort, and education, and the pleasure and happiness of its useful inhabitants. Children who leave the earth world in their early years will continue their studies from where, where they left off, eliminating from the latter all that are no further use, and adding those that are spiritualistically essential. All children, as must be expected, have the same opportunities, the same rights to their spiritual heritage as we all have here, young and old, and we are all have the same great goal, perfect and perpetual happiness. So that's by Monsignor U. Benson in a Life in the World Unseen. Just share those with you guys. So. Um, Yes, yeah. well, I I think that um it the the one thing that's so exciting about this book, as I said, and and I I was able to to get a copy of this book very early on in my journey. So um it it's wonderful because it echoes a lot of what we say. And one of the things in chapter nine, for instance, is uh that you say immediately it is important that you realize that your child is alive and well in another dimension even if you cannot understand where or what this means it does not alter the fact that they can hear your thoughts um quite clearly and concisely so um we we can communicate with them even if we aren't necessarily hearing what they are responding is is that correct 
Very, very much, very, very much, Elizabeth, because they live in a, a really a mental world where we're living in a physical vibration. They're in a mental vibration. So thoughts are, and frequencies, thoughts are very, they're amplified. So they hear your thoughts very clearly. They hear your prayers, your thoughts. They're aware of your, they're aware of everything you think about. Um, in that world, you should remember that it's not um, limited by time. There is no time in that world. It's not a linear world. And they can be in several places at once. It's a very vast world. But that love connection that they have with you stays connected and they'll always stay with you because the soul i often say the soul you think of the soul this is a soul no 20 percent of the soul is in the body 80 percent is outside the body or, or or maybe 30 and 70 but most of who we are as a soul is outside the limitations of the physical so really we're kind of with them on a higher level anyway but i've had as you said elizabeth in that chapter and in, on many other readings i've done I've had many children come by and say, why, mommy and daddy, why are you crying? I'm here. And they get, they get confused in a way because they're very, very alive and they don't understand why the parents don't know that they're alive. And I also had, this is an interesting one. I remember having this probably several times. Uh, uh, I remember once was a young boy said to his mom, mommy, why do you go to look at the ground? I'm not there. You know, I'm not there. I'm next to you. So that's, that was very interesting. And another time I had a child come through and said to um, a mother and father in New Jersey, and I was doing a demonstration, and the, um, the young man was killed in a car accident and by a drunk driver, which I find happens often. The drunk driver lives and, and that soul passed. And he said, mom and dad, this is a lesson of forgiveness. I've forgiven him. Now you have to forgive him. So it's very, very interesting because if you don't forgive, it'll continue in your own lives. And that not forgiving will affect every other aspect of your life. So that that was really interesting. And then he said, and if, you know, you can't, then it might pass to the next generation, that, that same energy of not being able to forgive. And if it, it really forgiveness is a medicine we give ourselves. And, and, and again, it's not easy losing the physical part of our children because it seems unnatural. But, you know, I believe that a soul um, there is no time. There is no, no time for a soul. I think it's all about experiences. It's all about coming back to school. And this earth school, like I said, is a hard place, but it's an important one. Um, and there are some souls that come back for just the experience of birth. And that's all they have to do. And then they pass over. They graduate and go home. Thank God. That's all they have to go is that, that experience. Some two years, some five years, some 20 years, some through suicide, some through mental illness, some through an accident, whatever that is, some, you know, whatever what might be. It, it, that doesn't matter how the soul exits. It's, it, there's, there's, you know, we physical people think, well, we live to 80, 90 years. That's a great thing. For a soul, that's a long time. The soul just has to go through the experience of birth, boy. Well, how lucky that soul is, because this is a hard place. It's a it's a hard place. But, um, you know, I, I always people have asked me, you know, what do you think about death? And this two days ago, I, was, I told a friend and I said, you know, I, I really look forward to it. I look forward to that reception. I look forward to I know I've done work here to help others and serving others. And I think that's what we as humans can do. And, and I think um, a losing it, losing a child. It's not, I think everything in life are opportunities. It depends how we look at them and how we use the opportunity. I read for a, a good friend now, which has been 35 years ago in New York. She lost her son when she was he was driving home from college, and uh, her name is Marie Levine. She's a compassionate friend. I remember doing this reading for her in New York, and um, her son died and uh, in this car accident, and, and he came through with some great information. And she said, I don't want to live anymore. Why should I live? I said, Marie, he said, you have important work to do. Marie, you and him agreed upon this, this departure. You agreed upon this. And she goes, why would I agree upon this? Why would I agree? Because you're so into it. The, the grief, which is natural, that, that first happened. I said, he's telling me later, you'll understand, but you're going to help a lot of people with this. And she goes, no, I just, I, there's no reason to live anymore. Why should I? See, because you agreed upon this. There's a reason why this happened, because, it, you know, many times it forces us on our spiritual journey. That if it didn't happen, you wouldn't be questioning God, your spiritual journey, who you are as a soul. What does all this mean? You wouldn't do that. Something dramatic had to happen in order for you to get on your journey, on your path. So I'll make a long story short. And it was a really good reading. I was saying it was really good. And when she's a great New York personality, I'm from New York, and she has such a great personality, became good friends. And we stayed friends. She worked a lot with compassionate friends, um, and, and, and local and, and national. She's still with them. And um, she's written the, several books now. And now she's... Um, total believer of course because she's had her own experiences and i think when one's mind starts opening up to the possibility that there's so much more than just the physical and that when we open up and we're not so tight and hold back we can open up we allow them room to come into our mindset 
and we and we can hear them and feel them more. And she talks to them all the time with her, her mind because really we communicate telepathically. When, when you pass the spirit world, you don't speak physically. It's all telepathic. And, and the mind is the soul. The soul is a mind. So it's really mind-to-mind -mind communication. And that's how mediums like myself work. We're just really getting telepathically picking up information from their soul, their mind. They're sending a thought, a memory, a feeling, an emotion into my mind. And I have to open myself up in such a space that I kind of surrender to that, that space. And, and whatever comes in, comes in. And it's not up to me to see what that means or color that in any way I have to be as pure as i can with whatever comes through and and that's that's what a good medium is that's what a developed medium does and, and those who are not will not do that so it's, it's, a, it's an interesting thing anyway so that that's i just want to share that too the more open we are and and, and if we and, and grief is a tough one grief is a, it's, a, it's a tough lesson there are many le lessons in grief i wrote a book called healing grief which is like one of the best books on grief but it teaches us so many things that life also is a transformation that's everything's transformative there's nothing gets stuck there's nothing should be stuck because life is all about movement 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 um and, and and in some way it helps us to know ourselves better understand our worlds better, understand ourselves better. And it's not a punishment, even though we think it might be a, a punishment. What did I do wrong? Oh, how could I have done this? It's not a punishment. It's a growth. It's an opportunity. But it just depends how we look at it, you see. And, and we can get stuck up by it, stuck. Um, there's a wonderful friend of mine taught me, taught me, shared with me a show that's on Netflix uh, called, I think it's um, uh, Stotes, Dr. Stotes, and it's um, an actor who goes to his therapy appointments with his therapist, and the therapist talks about different tools that people move on. And he said, one thing you get caught up is in the maze of the repeat of the past, and you live in the maze and you can't move forward, and you can't grow if you can't move forward. And that, so some people are caught up in this maze in all different areas in life. And I'm still watching it, but it, it, Dr. Studs, that's to you, DDS, you can say Netflix. Um, so anyway, that, I'm getting I'm getting carried away, but <laughs> I'm enthusiastic. Well, this is so exciting. We have lots yeah. of questions. In the okay. Chat. And I know that Irene wanted to start out with a question herself. So if, if yeah, possible. we do. We we have some great questions that Elizabeth is going to read. But I love James in the book when you talked about um, your soul's plan and you said it's a unique blueprint for its spiritual evolution. And you talked about soul packs versus soul plans. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, um, you know, we have to understand that there's soul groups and a soul group, and there are many soul groups, and we're part of many soul groups. And I, and I think again, if we if we just become become more aware of that the possibility that we're um, alive in many levels, if we will. So if, if most of our soul is outside here, that also means there could be many aspects of life, or many galaxies, or many places to be as part of our soul as well. Um, the ones that come together, I have my puppy in the background. You're going to hear her. Um, <laughs> she, she just wants to daddy's attention so so group so as as this time around your your, your family our family our friends uh, people we might work with a partner with are part of a soul group or a soul pack so we call the same thing group or pack and there are uh, various lessons that we're going to teach each other if you will together or separate and and it's interesting because as we evolve individually as a soul we're also helping that group to in, to also grow as long because we're all connected we're all, so we all have to kind of help each other out there are also within that i write also about um soul uh, destiny points and there are certain points of growth that we we as souls will have to go through kind of like classes we have to take and uh, that we choose to um some are easy some are hard and again like i said earlier the harder ones are reserved for those more advanced souls or those who want to grow more um, so I think that might answer that, Irene, if that makes any sense. I hope so. Yes, yes, it does. Thank you. That's beautiful. And Jaina asked a question that is very interesting. You've been instrumental in her healing. She says it's overwhelming to be here with you oh, in this meeting because you. you were so instrumental in my grief process almost 20 years ago when my partner and mother uh, passed. Now, uh, thank you so much for all you do, James. Thank now, you. as a shining light parent, uh, which is what we call ourselves. I'm curious, have your views or opinions changed about the afterlife over the decades? Oh, it's a great question. Great question. And, and, and yes, uh, yes, uh, it's changed about the afterlife. It's changed about the earth life, Real, more in the earth life, I think, than, than the afterlife. My dog is tearing apart my office. Um, I, I really more in the earth life, I guess, than the uh, afterlife. I, I, I realize the afterlife 
and maybe it's because of the age too, the older I get, I'm 64 now, but and I've been doing this work for so many years. And after a while, of hundreds of thousands of spirits coming through, you have to pick up remnants of something. So I know that there's a vast world within worlds within worlds, and there are many spaces and places, and that we go to the vibration, which we think of. So our mind really will gravitate to that, that world, that space, that it, it's, it's reality. So um, if we believe, for instance, like a religion, if someone's a very, let's say, a, a Catholicism or, or Judaism or Hinduism, and that's what your belief system is, you will go there. And there's all different levels to the heavenly world. I think the more I, the, the older I get, and the more I realize that life is short and that we can't live in the past, we shouldn't live in the future because the past has already happened, the future is yet to be. And, and really all we have is this moment now. And uh, something very interesting happened to me, which I didn't expect. I had a dog, Maisie, 17 years old, and um, we we're closest thing possible. Uh, and I divorced my husband, and she became closest to me than ever. And, um, and uh, when she passed, it was really hard because I let her go. And uh, I didn't grieve for her. And I was like, why am I not grieving? I thought I'd be in wreck because I lived every single moment with her, the fullest of every moment. So I learned that we have to live every full, full moment we have, and we shouldn't waste our time on this earth because it's valuable and it goes like that. And, and I think that we have to um, really uh, uh, take the time to live through each moment. And I think that on the other side, it, it, it's, it's a really a reflection of what you do here, of what you want to, to do here and who you are. Um, you're exactly the same over there, if you will. You, know, you don't change that greatly. So it, it's really important when you're in the earth world, the physical world, to really open up as much as you can, to learn as much as you can, to discover as much as you can, and to be non-judgmental. And to really what I found out is um, how you treat people is really important. And, and the golden rule is, is vastly important because when you pass over, you have a life review and you become aware of every situation. And it's, there's no time, but it happens very quickly. You become aware of every situation where you sent out an energy. So let's say you were in a, a bad mood one day and you went to, and, and yelled at somebody at a store or something. You'll feel how they felt when you yelled at them. 10 times, 20 times, 30 times stronger than when the original thought was, the original word. And you'll see how that effect affected that person and another person they talked to and the other person they talked to. And you realize how your one word, your one thought had a rippling effect of all these people and you were the one responsible for that. And, and, and I know that to be true too because I had near-death experience. And I experienced that in my near-death experience, which happened so quickly that it seemed like everybody had a cord of light above their head going into this huge tapestry. And, and I realized that all thoughts had color to them and the color bled into this tapestry, depending on the type of thought it was. So if it was a loving thought, a compassionate thought, it was a lighter color, but if it was a fearful thought or anger or judgmental. It darkened that tapestry. And at the end of our life, we went over there. We saw what we, what we contributed to that human tapestry. And that's where you have to look at yourself and say, wow. And there is no God that goes, you go here, you go there. We judge ourselves and we see if we pass those tests or we didn't pass those tests. So I think that's interesting. So that's what I've, more and more of that has become more intense in my awareness, I guess you'd say. That's fascinating. And I think that Janie probably was really excited to hear that answer. And Patrice has sent something by private message. I, it's, it's really interesting. Um, the idea of being on earth as hard or as hardship is a difficult one, particularly for those of us whose children absolutely loved life. Isn't getting to be in human form the greatest gift the soul can experience to be immersed in all creation. Can't both the human experience and the soul experience be equally meaningful? Um, she's just wondering what your thoughts are on that. But what would you say for that? James? Well, I, you know what I'd say, Elizabeth, I guess it depends on how you live, right? So I, I'm very happy uh, in a way, even though my dog is not content here. Um, I'm very happy in that. Every day I wake up with joy in my heart. And it's, 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 not a, it's not an easy place. And a lot of things are going around in the world right now, the whole COVID thing, the political thing, all the things going on. But I think one has to be happy within themselves. We can't change that macrocosm without first ch changing the microcosm. And we have to find that spirit, that soul self, because our spirit's within us. We're, at, we're here. And we've got to find that joy within us. Um, cause, because this is where we are. We can't just have it there. Yes, it's, it, there's, it's over there. It's vastly beautiful. But also you have to remember, it's what you bring to that world from living in this world. And if you want to make a happy world over there, you have to make a happy world here. And we can do both. There's no reason why you can't be happy and joyful here. And, and realize that 
um, we're more than just this physical body. As like I said, this is a little point of us. And, and that souls, um, that's our natural world. That's our home. This is not our home. This is a journey. And, and also I, I say, also we have to consider the possibilities that it's all experiences, it's all lessons. And I often talk to some parents of, and it's come through, not, not all the readings, but some readings have come through. It's, it's an important point that in another lifetime you left early and I had to go through this pain and understand what that lesson was. And now it's turned around. So now you have to learn it. So it goes both sides of the coin. And it's all about love. It's all about love. Fear, by the way, is a human emotion. That's not in the spirit world. Fear is here. So yes, we can be joyful and spiritual here, but there's a lot of fear here and it depends on where we want to put our mindset we want to live in fear and anger and resentment and guilt and hold on and what be in that maze or do you want to say you know i believe in a divine force i believe in something that's better than us bigger than us that there's an intelligence in that or there's an intelligence there that can change seasons can move planets that far better than, than we know and i like to believe that and i believe that everyone is made of love we're, we are pure loving beings and that we can't forget that and and the other thing i just want to throw in if you don't mind me just jumping in that we begin to be very very careful we don't judge others because you know judging someone else is is really fear-based because we judge people because we want to feel better than or we want to feel in control so we might judge somebody so we feel in control and fear is a f-e-a-r false ego appearing real and and, and judgment it, it's a fear-based emotion and, and all there is is love and we don't know you know another thing we have a lot of us have to go through lessons of we place unrealistic expectations on others you know others don't breathe the way i do others don't see this the way i do we have to realize that everybody is at the level that they're at there are some people that are very evolved and there are some that are limited and that could be family members as well there are people that you know you get a great message from your, your son or your daughter or, or someone in your family you're like this is great i gotta share it with everyone well you might go to your partner or people in your family oh you're crazy they're just not ready for it they're just not the space, same space that you are maybe and we have to accept that that people here on this earth are from all different levels of, of awareness well that's a beautiful way of saying it and i think that uh, one of the things that um, Diana is, uh, wanted to uh, go a little bit further in your thinking, she says that her son's crossing over has taught her the importance of activating and experiencing joy with what time I have left, which is something that I think that all of us experience as Shining Light parents, that we want to do as much as we can in their names, especially, and to make them proud before we get over there to see them. And um, I, I feel very grateful that I now know that myself because of the fact that I've had a child who's transitioned. I know that they are happy, healthy, and whole, and I want to be able to do as much as I can here in the meantime. But I also have a question that's very, very interesting. And um, when you're talking about the fact that you're talking, you're communicating mind to mind, um, obviously that might have an element of ego in that. Um, does does that uh, create issues in terms of communicating with our loved ones on the other side? Yes, yes, it's certainly a great question. Yes, it does. Of course it does. Because, and it's very interesting when you're working with developing mediums or student mediums and any uh, regular people, um, they worry about it and they're like, oh, I, 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 they think about it, think about it. I said, no, you know, you're in your head. When you think about it, you can't do it because it's so subtle. You have to go to your heart from your, because your critical mind, it'll critical, it can be critical, it'll analyze, it'll pull apart. And because that's what we're used to in survival mode here in this physical vibration. But if we go to the heart, to see the soul and where love is, and we sit in that space of the heart, it's much easier. And and if we we really got to learn to surrender the mind, surrender and let ourselves go. Um, and next time we do, when I'm back, we'll do an exercise, by the way, which is a good one for that and bringing spirit in for each person here. You'll it'll be an exercise i'll do next week next time um but yeah so if you're if you're open-minded and you surrender that space you'll be able to hear things and know things and feel things but if you try to control that space that's the ego getting involved and that'll color that'll color the the, the message and that for me and gordon who were very very similar in this uh, we have great integrity about that and 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 we watch we've had discussions about it, uh, mediums now coming up uh, like the guy on tv tyler henry who God bless them, but he's not developed. And, and, and it's showing people out in public 
this way of mediumship, but it's not, it's really psychic and then needs some little bits of mediumship. And for us, we've been around a long time and developed, the, you know, we just want to take apart and say, this is the right way to do it. Um, you have to, because you have people's lives in your hands and, uh, you know, you have to be very, very careful. So yeah, the, the ego, it, it wants you, and once you let the ego go and, and you let go of control and everybody should realize you have no control. No one here has any control. Sorry, no control. You can't control someone else. You just can't do it. You can't control what's going to happen. It's going to be what's going to be. The only thing we can control is how we respond to something. That's what we can't control. So if someone says something to you which you don't like, you don't have, to, don't have a knee-jerk reaction and go right back to them. Stop, take a few de deep breaths, observe what's happening, and then you may say from your heart, that doesn't work for me, that energy. I'm sorry. And then set boundaries. That's not that's not right for me. That might be right for you, but not for me. But I think that's important that we have that aware, that observation. And um, the openness, the openness, the more aware we can be of, of being open-minded and, and, and living in gratitude uh, and surrendering, the closer we are to spirit. That's beautiful. And so um, Teresa is asking a question that kind of goes along with the tapestry, uh, the, what you were talking about with the tapestry. She says, so are very mean and evil type people over there in a lower kind of rung of, of uh, that sure. area? Sure, a lower realm, if you could say. Um, there, yes, and, and I, and you know, you you feel sorry for those souls who who, and, and you know, it's so funny. People say, "Well, aren't you scared to talk to dead people?" And I say, "I'm more afraid of the living than of the dead because I'll leave the dead, I don't get it. but the living, you don't know." And I see, um, I'm aware of abuse of children all the time. I'm aware of abuse of uh, people of, of, of you know ethnicities, certain ethnicities, and to me, it's 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 hurtful. It, it it just hurts me because they don't realize that we're all connected, you know, we're all, we all, the biggest illusions we have, two greatest illusions we have, one death, we think there's death as an end, there is no death, you can't, you can't die, your energy, and the other is separativeness, that we're separate from one another, when really we're all connected, we only really look different and speak different languages, because we have to go through different lessons, and that, and that, that's why we take on those looks, and those, that vibration, those characteristics, but um, yeah, I, I think we've got to be very, very aware um, that, um, uh, you know, this, this this Earth School is an opportunity for the, so all different types of souls. So here you have baby souls, souls who are just beginning, if you will, the journey of realization. So they might be into um, power as money and greed and getting to the top. And then you have postgraduate souls who are healers and helping others and serving hum humankind. And then you have those mediums, great school souls, still trying to figure things out. And we're thrown in together with all these different levels of souls because that creates dynamics, that creates scenes, that creates um, uh, uh, classes for us to learn from, to go through these various experiences with different souls. That's how we're going to learn. So you will go to that level which you've created based upon your thoughts, your words, and your deeds. And now I have a great story for you, which if you don't mind uh, listening to this, is, is a good little parable. There was a very, very wealthy man that passes over. Um, this was told me years ago. Very, very wealthy man. He, he gets to the gates and the St. Peter's at the gates, right? And St. Peter welcomes him in and we'd expect him. He goes, thank you. And St. Peter shows him everything around. He sees the beautiful parks and the landscapes and the castles. And he walks around and goes, this is just gorgeous. I I'm sure my house is here. And St. Peter goes, yes, your house is down this way. Come with me. And he's really enjoying this landscape and the beauty and the, uh, the ocean view and the trees and the sunshine it looks like. And they go further down this road and the road starts curving and bending, going down and gets a little darker and the house becomes smaller. And he goes, are we going in the right direction? He goes, yes, we are. And he goes, you'll be there in just a second. And they continue on their path. And then the road breaks down to dirt and you can barely see anything. And there are little hobbles going there and he can barely see people. He goes, well, where? God must have made a mistake. I was one of the richest men in the world. I owned a lot of people. I had a lot of people work for me. I, 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 God must have made a mistake. And St. Peter said, God doesn't make mistakes. He goes, come on, further, it's right over here. They go down a little further, and he goes, there's your place to the left. You can barely see it. He goes, that little thing, that shack? And he said, yes, that's yours. It has your name on it. He goes, that can't be. I was one of the richest men in the world. I had great, great wealth, and, and, and I owned people and did a lot of work. He said, we can only build with materials you sent us. <laughs> that's amazing. That's just beautiful. And I... <laughs> 
Oh my gosh. Isn't that great? Isn't it a great one? And it's so yeah, it's true. Good. It's, it's so true. Sense, obviously. So Irene has a great question she'd like to ask you. Okay. Yes, James. I loved in the book when you um, wrote about what happens at the moment we leave our bodies, the moment we die. If you could talk about that. Well, it, it's, it's different for every single individual soul because each soul is different. So each experience is different. The more one is more aware of, as everyone here is now, because you've been going through this experience of, of death with, with your loved one, um, you'll have an, more of an opening awareness that there is no death. Um, and, and it's really, I had a good friend in Debbie Ford who was a spiritual teacher and helped her pass over. Um, and it was distance. I did it in, through meditation. And, and it was really, it's one of the easiest things you're ever going to do is pass because it's like a breath uh the, the worst part about death to me is is getting there so and if it's like um something which drains the body uh like a cancer or an illness that is in pain that to me is is not good because there should be no pain and that's why um the the, the higher-minded philosophical doctors or scientists developed or inspired scientists come up with medicines that will take the pain away you don't need to be in pain no one needs to be in pain so uh, I know it's my time if I need in pain, morphine me out, take me out of here, please, because it's a, it's a compassionate thing to do. But we've done it millions and millions and millions of times we've left the body because we've had many, 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 many lifetimes. So it's a natural vibration. Um, I want to share with everybody, too, that there's a lovely, it was a lovely physical medium named Leslie Flint that some of you might be familiar with. And Leslie Flint would uh, sit in a seance room. Uh, I sat with him three times. And it was a, what's it called a voice box, an ectoplasmic voice box. And it, this material came out of his ear and out of his nose. And it created a, a, a larynx, an artificial larynx. And the spirit people describe it like a catcher's ma ma mask. And you could, they send their thoughts through it. And you hear their voices, that is what you did on Earth. And Queen Victoria's come through, um, Houdini's come through, uh, Ruta Valentino's come through, Oscar Wilde came through, and you can actually hear this at Leslie Flint Trust uh, on, online. There's, they have uh, tapes of uh, this, these researchers, these scientists did 30 years, at least, of the real-to-real -real tape recordings of some of these, and you'll love what you find, you'll love what you hear. One lady in particular said, and she was a, a lady from Scotland, so I can't do the Scottish accent yet, because I haven't been around Gordon that long yet but just they said rose how did you find yourself when you first passed and it's oh I, I don't really know just i don't know i was i was sitting there watching the telly and i didn't know and next thing i know i i'm in a, in a bed in a hospital and she said i didn't understand it all seemed very strange i felt fine just a few moments ago i don't understand and i looked over and it seemed to be a hospital i guess not like the hospitals you have there but but it was open air and there's a little girl about three or four years old in the bed next to me and she looks over to me and I said, what are you doing here? And she goes, oh, I died of diphtheria. She goes, you died of diphtheria? You're dead. And she goes, yes, yes, you're dead. And then she goes, it's all very strange. And she goes, and then Margaret, my sister who's been dead for 20 years, came into the room and she said, hello, hello Rose, good to see you. And she goes, what are you doing here? You're dead. She goes, yeah, you're dead too. She goes, but I feel very alive. I feel so wonderful. She goes, and I'm dressed so nicely. And her sister said, oh, we dressed you with our thoughts. She goes, don't worry, it's all a lot, but just rest and it'll all, you'll, you'll calm down and soon they'll come for you, we'll come for you and bring you and you'll understand more. But that's what it was like, um, Irene. It, it, and many times, I, I can't tell you how many times, hundreds of thousands, I've had spirits say it was one of the easiest things that ever went through. Um, it, it life was harder. And um, I, I can tell you when I had my near, near the experience and I was just popped out of my body and um, my head hit the floor of, a, of a, this whole thing and I popped out and I'm like, where am I? Because I knew I wasn't, it wasn't my time. I just knew it. But when I came back in the body and it was just, and um, heard my, my friend Brian say, James, wake up, wake up. And my head hurt like crazy. And I'm like, oh, and I knew I was in this confines of the body. And the first words out of my mouth and blood was everywhere. And the first words out of my mouth were um, living, uh, dying is easy. Living, living is hard. Mm -hmm. And I've heard that Thank so you. Much spirit so many times. Thank you. Well, I um I think that that's a really good explanation, and it certainly makes everyone I, I'm sure much more reassured to know that um immediately we're we're 
greeted with people that we know and love and they dress us. <laughs> and they, us they wait for you. They prepare for you. They, they say they wait, prepare for you. They look forward to your coming. They have a reception. My friend said, what do you look forward to? I said, I, I'm looking for the reception. I want to pick out the, the songs we're going to have over there, what it's going to look like over there. It's, it's a reunion. You know, love never dies. Love never dies. And they look forward, but they want us to be happy here. They don't want us to be sad because they pick up our sadness. They pick up and they understand that the, that the human experience of the grief and losing, especially children, it's a hard one. It's the hardest one there is. But they also know and they've said, we want you to live life. We have you have to please live life. Um, and as you said earlier, I think, Elizabeth, about continuing on what they would have done, doing something for them. I think life is um, I mean, death comes with death. Death is a gift in some way. And but we usually have to have the courage to open up that that present and see what's inside for us. What what are the riches that that, that our our child left us? If, you know. Well, the collateral beauty, as we call it, and the silver lining. We also name it the silver lining. So it there are a lot of things that we get to know and understand uh, when our children have passed. And Felice is asking something that I I kind of wonder myself about sometimes and I think it's a really good question so if we are here for a lesson and we are really souls from earth that have planned this um how come we don't know any of this when we get here on earth it is like starting from square one then if we learn a lesson go back home to the spirit world come back down to earth again how come we don't know all that we've already learned it feels like this is a step this is step one. And then the next time it's step one again. Um, she says, I hope you understand what I mean. Maybe you can uh, explain yes, I, a little bit better. Yes, I, I think I can understand your crazy question because I have a crazy answer and it's a crazy thing. So this is good. It's a good question. Excellent question. Number one, um, we are souls who come back from human experience. And this is not our natural vibration. This is a human experience. And it's a school. And there are many, many lessons, not just one, but there are many lessons we come back for. And and, and really, a, a God in a, or the divine force, whatever you want to call that, I've heard it's a, it's a bit of grace from God not to remember things from the past. Because if we remember the atrocities, perhaps, or things that we did to others, when we come back here, um, but when we come back, when the salt comes back into the physical form, in the physical body, in the mom, in the mom's belly, uh, I've been told it can come in anywhere from you know seven eight months, uh, eight months. It checks things out, has communication, telepathic with the mother. You know something like a uh, mom to take care of better, you drink more water, eat better. You know, I had this experience with the mother. Don't smoke anymore. It's going to hurt us. And there's this telepathic communication, which continues on, obviously, because of survival. And um, it seems that that's what they call, the, that we go through the valley of forgetfulness when we finally come in to the body, which is like nine months or 10 months, by the way. And it's usually the crown chakra. We go through the crown. That's the last thing that the soft spot is what uh, finishes getting together. But it seems that we go through this valley of forgetfulness so we can start with a clean slate, okay? And we can start with, because if we were aware of things we did in the past, we might be so obsessed with what we did before and trying to make that better or do something about that, that we won't progress in this new lifetime, learning these new lessons or perfecting those lessons. But I will tell you this, that once your soul learns something, it's innately, there's a soul memory of something. And you will know with, and it, if you wanna know what you're about, what soul lessons there are, go into your soul, ask your soul, become more aware of your relationship with your soul. So I like to go through life, uh, my good friend Mavis Patilla, who's recently passed, used to say, my soul and I. So the more we have a relationship with our soul and, 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 and an opportunity, such as this as losing a child, is an opportunity to go in, to, to go into your soul and have relationship with that soul self and ask your soul, why am I here? Why am I going through certain things? What do I have to learn? What is my purpose? It's a great journey inward. And that's where you're gonna find your answers. It's inside your soul. Of course, that's just beautiful. So um, we all love Mavis as well. And um, she's come to speak for Helping Parents Heal. So we she, feel very grateful that she did. Um, one of our huge supporters of Helping Parents Heal, Suzanne Giesman, also wrote yes, a beautiful biography of her called Droplets of God. And so um, anyway. I know that study well. I do Mavis study well, you see. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
do sound like Mavis. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. We, we once did that in Long, in Long Beach, California. And she, was, I had, she had to have a cigarette. Jane, I had to have a cigarette. So we went out and we had to sit. <laughs> and, I, and I did her right in front of her. So anyway, Jane, and she looks at me and she had a look on her face. And it was so funny because she never heard me do that before with her. So we, had, we Jean and Mavis and I had those great times. We shared some wonderful times. Uh, and I had a house in Palm Springs they came out to. And certain things about Mavis, uh, people don't know, but uh, she was in a jacuzzi for the first time. And I walked out the backyard and there's Mavis. I'm like, whoa! I said, gee, what's going on? Oh, she just was found the jacuzzi. I'm like, oh, okay. And we had some, <laughs> we had some great laughs. She was a great, great person. We did a double demonstration once. It was when I first met her. And a double link. You, should, we, you guys might know double link where two this mediums work. And um, she was going on. She was into con the contact. And I was the second medium. And I, it's my turn to continue. And she wasn't looking at me. She wasn't connecting. And I'm like, oh, my God, what am I going to do? Because I have to get through the information from the spirit. And I'm looking at her friend, Jean. And I was like, what do I do? And I was tapping her, saying, "Are you done yet?" And I was like, "Push her off the stage." And it was so, so much fun. She had a great sense of humor. We had some great, great times. But yeah, great work of her spirit. Yeah. Oh, she's, she's just got such a huge, wonderful personality. And I, I never talk about those things in the past because she still does. I'm sure. Completely. Oh, she does. She does. Yes, she does. She's come through. She's come through uh, uh, two or three times really well for. Um, for Jean when I was on the phone with Jean and it was just and I wasn't expecting it because I, I knew she would eventually but I didn't go looking for it and it happened when I was shaving okay so many of you'll get messages from your family your friends when you're in the bathroom when you're when you're in the shower or bath or driving your car and the reason why is because your mind is open you see you're not thinking you're not, you're not trying to control that space so they able to come through so she came through really well and she, I said oh baby you're here and she goes yeah yes James and I said well what was it like because you know as a medium want to know and, and she said I can't say it was he goes it was beyond the beyond she goes that's all i can say it was beyond the beyond and that's mavis you know beyond the beyond and at one point she said i'm going to go to the poet society hall the poet society hall and um and Jean understood that very very well and she also talked to her about um you know stop worrying about my pictures that you're looking at in the dining room table and that morning she had all the pictures on the dining room table getting ready for the service i guess so yeah it, 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 yes great great person well, we, we have some of our uh, affiliate leaders who actually went over to um, uh, take part in her service um, just recently as well and um, are studying. We have a lot of affiliate leaders who uh, became, who developed their, their mediumship skills uh, after the tr uh, transition of their children. And so um, that's a very exciting thing for us. And one of them, speaking of which, has said, um, and she is one of the mediums that I'm speaking of, um, I have a question if there's an opportunity. My question is, James, I attended a two-day JVP event early in grief in 2017, I think. There is so much need these days and so much pain. How have you come to balance your self-care with your desire to serve? Love to you all, Claudia. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I, um, I, I think it's um, again, it's very interesting because that Netflix show is telling about Dr. Studd says so listening to. I was taking notes because he was saying the same thing that I said, but in different ways. You know, it's all the same thing but said differently. And and he came across something that I agree with. I think you have to find your passion. I, I think you have to have your life force, and I think life force creates more life. And I think when you find your passion and you live your passion, um, then you start living life fully. And I think that we have to, um, for me personally, I find, and I'm semi-retired, that um, I create beautiful gardens. Um, I love the joy in that. I love living simply, but I mean, I live in a nice house and, and I and I earned every single you know room in this house. I have worked really hard for it, which I'm very, I'm very proud of. And, um, but I love, it, it's, you know, it's really interesting. I'm going to cry again. Um, I, I don't hear it often, but I've heard um, recently a lot of people come up to me in whether it was the last class I did or on the street or at a home goods supply store. And people have said to me, you know, you gave me a reading many years ago and this changed my life. Or I've had a lot of that or this happened. That you forced me in the spiritual path. And, and that makes me feel good because I feel like I, you never know, you know, you just do the work and you do the service to help someone, but you rarely get the feedback. You see, you don't do it for feedback, but it's great when you hear that you've had made, you have such an influence on people. And, and when I first uh, was told I was a medium by Brian Hurst, uh, many years ago, in the 
40 years ago. And he said, you know, you're going to medium, you get changed the consciousness of the planet. I only went to him because my friend Carol wanted to see this medium, but I didn't know what a medium was. And I wanted to be a sitcom writer because I, in LA, I'm funny, I thought I'd make a career. And he said, you're a medium. And I said, what's that? He said, you're going to talk to the dead. And I said, I just want to be a sitcom writer. I want to talk to the dead. He said, the spirit people, they have, they have you know, plans. And he said, um, you're going to help change the consciousness of the planet. And I'm like, I just want to be a sitcom writer. He goes, no, in two years' time, they're going to start working with you. Now, just a quick little story here. Um, I, he was very good. He got very good information. And it got me thinking. It stirred up my soul. It stirred my soul. And I went to a bookstore called the Bodhi Tree Bookstore in L.A. It was like the New Age bookstore. And I read every, I mean, every weekend you, I went there and read. And it was a place you could sit down in chairs and just read different things about and near-death experiences or Hedger Casey or uh, psychic work. And I started meditating. Just because I thought it was fascinating. And I meditated visualizations about a rose or um, myself as a producer or whatever it was. And, I, and then I started working a lot of temporary jobs to make some money. And I was working then at Paramount Studios doing contracts. And it was, uh, I came back from lunch and I went to my cubicle. And I look over to this girl, her name was Joe Dallas, and she walks by and I see this dead lady behind her. And I look at this lady and she looks at me and she starts speaking to me telepathically and it was her grandmother. And she told her that it was, um, um, uh, she was from Idaho, the White House, yellow shutters or, and the footstool cover they made together. And this girl, I said, can I, can I say this to you? Because it sounded really weird. And I've never done this before. She goes, yeah. She goes, that was my grandma. She lived there. That's her house. And we made a footstool cover together. I said, oh my God. And more things came out. And I freaked out because I never experienced this. And I was like, oh my God, this I'm dead people. And I ran out of Paramount Studios, never go back again. And, that was, and, and I ran back to my apartment and freaked out because I didn't know what was going to happen. I never heard about this stuff before. How I was going to live a normal life? How could I communicate? How could I tell people? Am I crazy? I didn't know what to do. So I called up that medium, Brian Hurst, who I just wanted to thought I could call. I said, I don't understand what's going on. I saw this dead lady and I understood everything. And he said, James, don't you remember the spirit, what they told you, the prediction that they made about you changing the consciousness of the planet? I said, yeah. He said, James, that was two years ago today. <sighs> Wow. Oh my goodness. So, so, you know, when you think of the intelligence of that world, the intelligence of the spirit world, it's mind boggling. So to me, that keeps me alive. That me, that's that passionate that, that, I, that I call it the art of discovery. I, every day I want to discover something new about someone else, myself. How can I change someone by just a smile, by saying something nice to somebody and see the reaction? And for me, I can see the colors around them change. Their auric field changes. And people love love. And there's no reason why life is so short we need to spend spend you know love we need to give it out that's the right thing to do and that's how i live that's that's why that's why i balance the work i do and and i also have a doggy here that's i'm daddy too and the daddy mommy and everything and my gardens and i talk to my flowers my plants and you know i'm writing different things i'm gonna write a um a mystery novel, which I'm going to be doing that very soon. And I'm doing a musical, writing a musical, and I might be doing a show with um, Gordon. Gordon. So we're a couple of creative things going on here. We'll hopefully see what happens. Well, and I think it's important <laughs> for people to know that you're also a Broadway singer who got oh, kind yes. of sidetracked with that as well. Beautiful voice. And yeah. so you have a lot of a lot of possibilities um and you chose to be a medium and it, yes. it's such a huge um we're so grateful that you did because it's such a huge gift to all of us to be able to have you doing this and um i just want to say again that this book is just filled with love you were talking about love this is something that allows all of us to know that our kids first of all are still right here second exactly. of all they are doing and the, the same kind of things that they did while they're here and they're doing them with us and they're just in an even better place actually obviously yeah. you know that gives me a trip for a second my mother when she passed over and i was young and right before i did mediumship and then when I, when I was doing my mediumship and i went back to brian hurst and he said your mother is a guide of yours and i said well why wouldn't she move on he goes because she didn't feel she did enough for you in the physical world so she she's going to the spiritual world to helping you and i think it's true of our, our children who pass over and our and loved ones i think you know life is like a theater a stage and i think when that's over they go backstage and help us from behind and pull those strings and they make i think that there's a choice uh that or a plan if we will that they're going to go on and help us to fulfill our destinies back down here by being over there they can help us fulfill our destinies if we're open to different experiences i really believe that 
Well, and I think that it goes even farther than that. I think that it's not just the parents that they influence, but also their siblings. And I think that a lot of times these siblings are the, what they call indigo children, but the ones that are just going to be the most compassionate and the ones that are going to change the world as they move forward, because they have their brother or sister working with them from the other side, which is something that um, is very interesting to me, but I, I've seen that in many, many cases. And so, um, Again, silver linings and then also collateral beauty. And you you talk about it so easily and so well. And we're kind of running out of time, but I don't want to leave this conversation, but I am really- I'm available. We can talk more if you want. That's, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. And there are a lot of questions, but you know, we can also, again, we're going to have- um, James come back on the 22nd and I am so grateful that he's going to be with us again, but he's going to be doing um, validations messages from our kids, which is really he wanted to devote a whole night just to that, which is also wonderful. Um, Irene, did you have any other questions of James that you want? Um, no, I just want to say thank you and welcome to the Helping Parents Heal family. We'd thank love you. to have you and thank you. have you be be a part of us. This was just amazing. It was wonderful. Oh, you did want to say one thing, though. Mark Ireland is on tonight, and um, you were just talking about Richard Ireland, and so maybe we could unmute Mark very quickly if you'd like to, Irene. Sure. And, um, he could say something to James because it's kind of exciting that James he's unmuted. Yes. Hey, Mark. Hi, James. Hi, Irene and Elizabeth. Um, so I understand that Gordon shared the video, the YouTube video of my dad. Yes, yes. And I shared it with Lynn Probert, who's a British medium. And she stood right here, and we were both awe inspired. And she said, and I, 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 forgive my French, but she said, oh, fuck. <laughs> she said, <laughs> we could get it just a quarter of that information. And uh, what an incredible being your, your dad is. And I noticed that when he went in, when he went under, I would say, that accent changed a little bit. Isn't it interesting how the accent, he was influenced with a little bit of an accent that came in. But yeah, uh, he'd speak in a very staccato manner once he got into the zone and it will only take him a few moments. It was funny because like before he'd do a demonstration, I'd maybe be sitting by him and I would start talking. I'd turn and look at him and his eyes were shut and he's got, you know, getting into a meditative state yes. and then I just shut up. But can you imagine having a dad like that? I was going <laughs> to ask, what was that like? What was that like growing crazy. up with that? And he was a really good medium too, but what you saw there was more the psychic, but you know, they, they blend together too at yes, times. Yes, yes. Uh, but he was, he was phenomenal. He was, I guess today you'd call him a unicorn, but. <laughs> um, you must uh, feel him but, a lot around you, yeah? Do you feel him a lot? I do, yeah. He, he intervenes in different ways in my life. Um, it's kind of funny how he's pulled a lot of things together. Um, and I'm sure worked with my son and all of us to try and build this organization too. Sure. Sure. Um, but, you know, aside from the abilities he had, which were phenomenal, he was a tremendous human being and uh, all the things you talked about earlier, he, he was non-judgmental. He loved everybody. He embraced people. He he moved people into our house, you know, to the dismay of, <laughs> of others, just, you know, to give them a place to stay for a while or whatever. So he did all that stuff that we all talk about. Um his and, vibration, he had his flaws watching, too, but his but vibration a good man. was watching that tape with Lynn here, and we're watching it. His vibration, and that's what I'm going to talk about energy, was so clear and pure and loving. He did that whole space was lit up, and it was like, wow, we wonder how many people can sense that, but not many could. But Lynn and I were like, wow. And it was just, he was right there. He was right centered into that work. And uh, incredible, incredible. I think one of the best American media, media clairvoyants, whatever you want to call it, psychics in the world ever. Yeah, I, I think, would. you know, from what I know, I think so too. I mean, I put Eileen Garrett up there, uh, maybe Arthur Ford. He he had, had stubbed his toe on some occasions, but he was pretty good. And, and um, Leslie Flint, have you heard of Leslie Flint, Mark? Yeah, no, yeah. I thought he was from the UK. Was he not from England? From the UK, or? from the UK, okay. yeah. He, he was, my mother came through him. And um, it was very interesting because uh, she talked about her voice. And she said, my name, Jamie, which no one knew. And um, and uh, she used to work for Walt Disney in New York in the 40s. And then, and my friend Brian Hurst, who was in the sales room, said, have you seen Walt? She goes, yes, yes. And it was her accent. And it was her, her voice. And she says, he's helping to work change that company, which changed after that. It was very interesting, but it just so proves that there's no death. It, it's just 
gosh, wouldn't we like everybody to just be live a life knowing there's no such thing as death? Wouldn't that be change? Wouldn't that change everything? And and also that we have to be responsible for what we say and what we yeah. do. I mean, I, and Thomas Jefferson came through Leslie and said, wars help no one. Wars were hurting each other. And, and if, if we had the intelligence, everyone had that awareness, well, what they give out, that they, they get back, we're all connected. Gosh, that would be so great. It would change the world. Yeah. Well, we all do our own little part toward that end. That's right. Um, it's That's the best right. we could do. I think the grassroots effort is the way to go because um, it's not going to happen through academia. Right, correct, uh, Mark. You know, uh, unfortunately, you still have that materialist mindset in there yeah. and overcoming that happens through things like this. And if it, we pay the taxes that pay their salary. So I, eventually we'll I, win. I, I, I had to do a spiritual show in Hollywood. So I understand. I did the show Ghost Whisperer. So I had to have spirituality and Hollywood coming together. And it was like a train wreck because I had a lot of egos and, and it was just a weird energy to be on that studio lot and to see where people are coming from. And it was... I don't know, a low vibration, I guess the best way to say it, but it was like, wow, an interesting thing. But thank God it was on because it opened people up in certain ways. But yeah, yeah. I just want to turn it into some dark horror story or whatever it seems. Fear, and, fear based, yeah. always fear, fear. Yeah. I'm friends with Alice Dubois and she had the show Medium based on sure. her life. Sure. And she, you know, I think three or four of the first episodes were actual true stories of things that had happened. Then after that, it just became Hollywoodized. It's Hollywoodized. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's so true. It's so true. And, and it's the same with um, Tyler Henry, who was, I think, a very good, it could be a very excellent medium. He has good potential, but hasn't developed it. And he's with producers who don't know this work, so they don't know how to present mm -hmm. it. And it's presented to the public, and they think that's the way it is. And it's like, oh, this is so sad, but... You know, we just, we can only do what we can do, you know. Jake, can you tell about the new show that might be happening and uh, that, that is going to be by the same producers? Yes, yeah, so, so, uh, yeah, so, so the producers that do Tyler's show, um, they know my work and uh, we have the same uh, account, well, representative, I guess you'd say. And um, I mentioned about Gordon and um, I said to Gordon after a demonstration we did here in San Diego, it went so well, maybe with the kilts we were wearing, but we had such a great <laughs> connection, him and I. And I, you know, I said, we should do a show called The Happy Mediums. So I presented it to a representation and the producer's lovely idea. So they want to do a, a presentation tape of us, uh, Gordon and myself together. So it'll be, it'll be called The Happy Mediums. And we're going to be doing all different types of things all over the world. At least that's what the plan is. It might change. But we want to show what true mediumship is by um, two, two elders in, in the field. And uh, I think it's going to be good because we're very, very similar him and, I, him and, my, and myself. So, yeah, we'll see what happens with it. You know? I did meet you briefly. I think um, John Holland introduced us because he's a friend, too. It was at the celebrate, celebrate your life. life. I thought I met you like five or seven ago. years ago, something okay. like that. I thought I might have met you. I thought, I, yeah. and you wrote a book, didn't you? Write a book? Yeah, I've got two books out. Um, yeah. Another one's about to come out through Inner Traditions. It's What's going that? to be called The Persistence of the Soul. Oh, good for you! Wow. Yeah, uh, the first one was Soul Shift, and that's what most people here know me by. That's right, Cheryl. I think I have it in my life. For oh, nice. <laughs> Yes, and I have your dad's book too, by the way, which I'm oh, awesome. at the end of. Yes, it's great. Yeah, not yeah. Wow, it's great. Very nice. Well, nice to meet you again. Yeah, same here. <laughs> we are just thrilled that you guys got to speak too. That's very exciting, especially very. since we've seen the the video of, of Richard Ireland, and and we are excited about having you again. This tonight has been absolutely wonderful. You are just so filled with oh. beautiful energy. And it I know that everyone on here can't help but leave with a smile and help by know where our kids are. It's a pretty great place, obviously. And we don't want them over there. That's the last thing that we would have ever wanted. But knowing that they're happy, happy, healthy, and whole, and of course, we're still here in school, so we've got a lot to learn, which is important. We need to be here and make them proud and learn as much as we can, but also help as many people as we can along the way. And so what you've told us tonight is uh, instrumental in helping us do so. And right. so we always ask people to un uh let's see unmute and say yes thank unmute you. say thank you <clears throat> thank you we're so looking thank forward you, to thank, thank you thank you james thank you. it was amazing thank you thank you so much it was wonderful in arizona
Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Such an honor. Thank you.